All right, well, maybe we can get started. It's these subscribers, that's all right. So please welcome, Jason Ons is here today. Um, yeah. you, he's uh, owns a company nearby in Smyrna called Onks Woodwind Repair, or Woodwind Specialist. Specialists. And he's nationally renowned, probably internationally renowned in the oboe community as a great repairman. So he's gonna talk a little about how he got into that. So please welcome Jason Ons. Awesome. Well, um, I'm honored for the invitation, so thank you. Um, usually when I go out and speak with uh, oboe players is what I usually speak to, and uh, we'll go out and help the kids learn how not to uh, damage their instruments. Uh, I've been going out recently, I've been doing like a college tour, so every month I've been visiting a college, and I'll go out and actually help the, the college kids learn how to do their adjustments. So those of you that are oboe players, uh, know how critical that is uh, to be able to know which screw to turn. So talking to you guys about this today is slightly different. So I'm just going to ramble and then um, I'm totally open. You guys have questions, just interrupt me. Uh, we can ask questions along the way. We'll definitely do Q&A at the end, but uh, you know, if you have anything uh, as we get going. So um, Music industry. So I already went through and asked you guys, you know, what your instruments are. Um, what are your aspirations? Some of you want to be professional players. Yeah. Teachers. Okay. Part of the music industry. Do you want to do something outside of performance or education? Like what? Well, I'm going to become a music therapist. Okay. Online. Excellent. Okay. Uh, some other occupation? Okay, repair. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> I can vouch for that one. Is there any place around here that teaches we'll get to that. <laughs> Man, you just go right to the... I mean, there's no romance for, for what you do, Charles. you just like, bam. Uh, we'll get there. Um, uh, any other uh, industries somebody's thinking about? Okay. Well, we don't have music to play without you. So that's a good one to have. Cool. All right. Um, so those are all good things. And a lot of those things um, you can do on your own. So you can have your, be self-employed. You could start a, a therapy uh, business. Um, obviously you can compose on your own, but I'm sure there's larger entities that could hire you or I don't know anything about composing. So I'm just making that up. But um, I'm sure there's some place you can work through to do that um, as a, a team member or employee, but you definitely do that on your own, obviously. Um, so yeah, uh, a lot of a lot of ways to go um, as far as whether employment or self-employment, uh, being uh, a team member somewhere. So how I kind of got into it, I wanted to be a professional player. Uh, so just a little bit of my background. Uh, studied Arkansas State University for my undergraduate uh, in oboe performance and then went to University of Illinois in Champaign for my graduate studies. Um, oboist may know Nancy King who's currently at University of Michigan. Uh, that's who I studied with for my graduate work um, when she was at Illinois. Um, so had great teachers, Dan Ross. Uh, so those of you that knows gouging machines in the oboe world, uh, Dan Ross makes gouging machines which helps us oboe players make our reeds that we play and so the technical side of what I do now for a living really I was being cultivated all the way back in the beginning and I didn't realize it because I studied with Dan Ross and he's a very technical mechanical person and I watched him build these machines and do all this mechanical stuff do repairs uh, for five years yeah I took five years I, was, I took my time uh, to get through undergrad so um, so yeah, so I studied with those guys um, the whole time, wanted to do performance. Uh, then got about a year out from graduating from graduate school and started doing some low-key uh, auditions. Um, and so like for one would be like the Chicago Civic Orchestra. You know, it's not a fully professional orchestra, but it's, it is paid and it's really, really, really competitive to get in there um, and you don't really make that much money but it's almost as professional as you can get without making a, a real job and so frankly I didn't do well 
I uh, played like for three minutes and Alex Klein was the sole judge behind the screen. He said, thank you. Um, get out of here, basically, right? So, uh, so I did, and, but I was good with that. It was kind of the writing on the wall, sort of thinking about things. But like I said, um, all the way back to when I was a freshman at undergrad, studying with Dan Ross, I was tinkering. I was learning the mechanical stuff, and I didn't really realize uh, how handy that was gonna come in into play. So, um, and then all through undergrad and graduate school, I'd take the oboes apart, you know, just doing basic stuff, did stuff for my, my colleagues. Um, and so that's just when it hit me. I was like, everybody's been telling me all these years that I'd be really good at repair, and I never really listened to them. So I, that's when I started looking. So I, about a year to go in, in graduate school. Uh, there are schools, Charles, uh, that that you can go to and so I started looking at those uh, options and the one that I ultimately ended up going to had a three-year waiting list so I was like well that's not gonna work but I went there and visited anyway left uh, the guy's name my name with the guy and um, he's like well again it's three-year waiting list but I'll give you a call if something comes up didn't expect to hear from him two months later he did call me uh, he had this was in March of 98, March of 98, he called me. I was supposed to take another whole year to graduate, so basically two more semesters after that March. Um, and he's like, I got a spot, can you be here in January? I was like, let me get back to you. So went to my advisor, we worked it out, I finished the semester early, moved to Wisconsin um, January, and then, so the rest is history. Went to a repair school, um, was hired by a music store after that, and then ultimately started my business. So, um, did I know what I was doing? No. <laughs> um, you know, you may, you may see, quote, successful people that you look up to or, you know, business people that look very successful. I guarantee you most of them didn't know what they were doing and still don't know. Yes, you get more experience as you go along, uh, but, but you learn so much of it uh, on the go. Um, so that's kind of really fast condensed um, of, of my history. Um, so how do you set up a business? Uh, you know, if you guys want to go out on your own, how do you want to, how do you do that? How do you know to do that? Anybody have an idea? This is a participation group. <laughs> Start small. Yes. Could be. Anybody else? Develop a product or service that you know will attract attention. And what about that product or service is important? Yes, but also are you passionate about that service, right? So we can all uh, watch the infomercials and we can all buy Mary Kay, um, buy your Mary Kay starter kit and, and sell Mary Kay cosmetics on the side, but it's not gonna work out if you're not passionate, right? There's so many, so many business opportunities out there uh, on the internet if y'all stay up late and watch the infomercials, it's so easy, right? Everybody's doing it. You know, sell, sell real estate or whatever the, the product is that they're trying to get you to buy. Um, so you definitely, definitely have to have something that, uh, that you're passionate about and enjoy doing. One of the things that's been a blessing uh, for me and my family, um, uh, you guys are in the throes of college right now, and so not going to get into this with you, but maybe some of you are borrowing money to do so. Um, maybe some of you are blessed uh, to have family that are paying for it, or maybe a combination of both. Um, but as you start slow and small, um, if you can do whatever you do debt free as much as possible, uh, that's going to be such a huge benefit. It's going to be such a stress reliever for you. Um, for me, 
I didn't necessarily start 100% debt free, um, which I guess would, I didn't start debt free. Um, but then shortly after I started my business, um, my wife and I were able to do so. And so we have been uh, debt free the past 13 years, basically. So living on what we make, uh, no credit cards at all. And um, it allows you so much more freedom to just do what it is uh, that you do. And so that's, that's a really huge one that if you can come off and do that, um, especially if you're looking to start your own business. Um, but if you wanted to go out and do something really big, like start a crane company or something, um, you know, there's a lot of capital on that type of stuff. But, uh, but even in sales, let's say the flute players in here, say you guys wanted to go into a repair and like you guys teamed up and we're going to be a, a sales repair uh, business, right? Um, there's probably a need for that in the flute world. I know there's a few people out there doing it, but um, flutes can be very expensive. Oboe players and clarinet players, you think you got it bad? No way. <laughs> These flute players are crazy. They, they spend more for a head joint than our whole oboe does uh, in some cases. So, um, but yeah, if you guys were going to start a business and you wanted to start selling instruments, there's a huge, huge capital there. So there are op obstacles to, to come overcome for that, but there are ways to do it. You just have to be very creative and, and take your time uh, doing so. Any questions so far? When yes. You, when you were in repair school, did they, did they teach you business, like small business classes, like how to start your business, or did you have to learn all of that on the fly? They did not. Yeah, so yeah, that's a good good question. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so the repair school that I went to, um, and I'll, actually I've, I've got the, the repair school thing down we'll talk about. Uh, there's different types of schools. The one I went to was just a business that let apprentices come in. So it was not like a school like this um, or a technical college. It was just simply you're in there, you're being apprenticed from day one, working on customer repairs from day one, um, which is cool. It's, it's not, not that scary as you think because you go and you're just doing like little tiny things at first, right? So, and they're just teaching you as you go. Um, but yeah, so it was a one year program. Some of the other schools that, that I'll mention to you later um, or two years, I think, uh, some of them for sure. Um, and those are more lecture and hands-on, whereas the one I went to is just all hands-on. And you just learn from whoever the big guy Ed next to you that's teaching you, right? Um, that's what you learn, what they decide to teach you that day. Um, so yeah, it's because it's one year, it's just like every day, all day, just doing it over and over and over and over. And so, yeah, there's nobody teaching you anything about business whatsoever. Um, and for me, that was kind of one of my biggest hurdles. Uh, I got hired by a music store in Savannah, Georgia. I worked there for six years, and that's when I decided to leave. Uh, and Because I, in the back of my head, I always knew I wanted to do oboe specialty repair. Um, and so it, I worked with a bunch of great general uh, band re repair techs uh, for five to six years and just learned a ton from those guys, just doing a million flutes, student flutes, Gemeinharts and Bundys and you know all that kind of stuff. Uh, doing those uh, like I did, I remember my first weeks when after I got hired, you know, because it's a music store, they have all these rental things that they rent out for decades and they're like just terrible. So he brought me like a cart with like 50 Bundy clarinets on it and I had to overhaul every one of them it was just like one after another for weeks and weeks and weeks and that's you know that's how you learn uh, just doing it but um, um, yeah so no nothing about business uh, in, in school uh, and then nothing about business working at the music store and then so when I decided it was time to leave um, and I made that decision, and I didn't 
in hindsight, one of the things I think that I did really well, and it was on accident, um, well, maybe not. I didn't want to just quit the music store because then I wouldn't have money, right? So I gave myself a time frame, and so I gave myself one whole year. Uh, when I decided it was time to leave, instead of just leaving, I gave myself a deadline. And so I did everything I needed to do to set my business up over the next year. So I had to buy a shop. I had nowhere to work. So I ended up buying like this 8 by 24 shed, you know, which is like 120 square feet. It's like super, super small. Um, had that put in my backyard and, and worked just in the backyard. Um, it was just a metal shed. So I like insulated it and drywalled it and put a heat system in there and all that. So I did all that stuff, um, bought tools. Um, you might ask, when did you learn about business? But didn't learn about business during that year. So I was just really planning and just thinking. Um, and I think you, if you ask a lot of uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, uh, what they did to learn that, um, a lot of them just learned it on the fly. And so I remember thinking to myself, um, I was like, man, when I get out of here, I'm going to have so much free time. I mean, it's like, you know, we would work 60, 70 hours a week at the music store just because there was so much work. Um, I was like, man, I'm going to work like four hours a day and wake up late and drink coffee and sit on the back porch. Um, and none of that was true. Uh, I did not, I don't think I did any of that. Matter of fact, I've never slept late actually. Um, like I tried to sleep this morning and got up at four, just couldn't just wake up. I'm ready to go. So, um, but that's, that's how I've always been. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, so, um, yeah, I thought I was going to have a lot of free time, but so this is where learning in the business came into play. So as a new business owner doing, instrument repair, just starting out my first weeks and months, I really didn't have that much work, right? So I guess technically I had free time, but now all of a sudden I had to figure out how do I run a business? Um, in Georgia, you know, what does the Georgia State Revenue Department, what do they uh, require of me? Of course, at that point I'd already bought like the business license and that kind of stuff, so that was, that's a no, no big deal. Um, but you know, what, what do the, the state and the federal entities require of me? So I had to figure all that out. I was like, okay, well, how do I bill out my customers? I didn't know, you know. So like invoicing software, you know, am I gonna just use the, the Microsoft Word generic invoicing that's free on your computer? You know, was I gonna do that? Or like buy QuickBooks or, you know, I didn't know. Um, you know, back then, those, the internet was still like dial-up, I think, so it was like really slow, you know, you can't get information. Um, so it was, all of that said, I spent hours and hours and hours just every day uh, just trying to learn how to do the business um, and obviously reaching out and trying to cultivate um, some work and, you know, try to keep, keep the bills paid uh, at that point, so. Uh, anybody in here doing any type of business class? Yeah, nice. Okay. Yeah, our music industry majors they can minor in either recording industry or entrepreneurship. So if they if they minor in entrepreneurship, then they take. But this is only my first semester, so I'm not too much. Gotcha, gotcha. So I won't ask too much. But you're gonna, you probably will take all types of business classes, I guess. Honestly, yeah. I haven't even looked at this. Yeah. Sure. So what are you taking now then? I'm just an intro to entrepreneurship. Okay. Right now. Yeah. Interesting. So. <laughs> but literally, I'm taking one day at a time. Okay. So you look the next semester. I'll okay. Learning. Yes, sir. So how do you like get your name out before you can grow your business? Good question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, back when I did it, we didn't have social media, right? Hold on a second. Got to get my notes back up. Um, there was no social media. So 
I'll go ahead and give you my spoiler like I was going to give you at the very end. Um, one of the guys I'm listening to right now just to kind of get re-pumped up for my business because even though I've had my business uh, for, uh, for 2005, what's that, 13, almost 14 years, and I have employees and I look very successful on the outside, but it can always be taken away at any point. If, if you don't continue working every day, it can be taken away. Um, and it won't happen you know, at one day, but it will happen if you don't cultivate and continue doing that. Um, so one of uh, my internet favorites, uh, somebody that I follow, and if you don't like cursing, you probably won't like listening to this dude, but uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, I don't know if anybody has heard of this guy, but he is an amazing, incredible uh, entrepreneur, speaker. Um, so if you look him up, he, he'll tell his story in just about every video. Basically, he is an immigrant uh, born in Belarus, Russia. Uh, his parents immigrated over and uh, his dad got a job uh, just stocking shelves in a liquor store. The dad excelled a little bit, ended up buying or owning their own liquor store. And so Gary, the son, um, grew up working in the liquor store. And so then by the time he gets to be 15 or 16, he really starts working in the liquor store. And that's the time, so anybody know what Google AdWords are? So Google AdWords is I can buy a word. Uh, let's say I want to know when people Google oboe repair. And so you can buy that. And then when people search it, they are hit with your ad. And when they click through your ad, and they come to you, you pay for that, right? And you hope that it ends up turning into business. So now, if I were to buy that word, it could be a couple bucks for a lead, right? So back in the beginning days of Google AdWords, you know, Gary was buying like just the simple term wine because nobody knew what it was. It was brand new, nobody was doing it for five cents. And so like he took his family's wine business, I know this is different than music, but just an example from like a three million, I think it was like three million to a $60 million wine store business in six years. Six years. So this dude has grown businesses. Uh, that one, he's got other businesses. Uh, he's in the uh, big time media, so like his company represents all the big like Procter and Gamble, Johnson Johnson, I don't know, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, whoever, they do all their media now. These companies pay Gary's team like hundreds of thousands of dollars a month to do their social. And so this guy has and he got D's and F's all through school. All through school. But he did it, he learned it. Anyway, look up that guy. Gary V for short. Gary Vaynerchuk. And so I'm listening to him now just to kind of get re-pumped up because uh, it's, you gotta, you kind of got to get that. Wait. Well, based on his question, I'm sure maybe you can testify or not. I didn't answer your question, about sorry. About relationships that, because a lot of, you know, I'm not super young, like these, just so much, but life experience and you realize how much of your relationships and people you meet as you're right. learning with them or training and, and keeping those relationships yeah. to keep when you, you start your own business of getting word of mouth and maybe, I don't know what did that affect Yes, you so to answer your question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have a mind of a squirrel, I guess, or is that the dog? It's the dog and the squirrel, anyway. Um, so for what I do uh, in Obo Repair, it's an extremely small niche industry, uh, as is clarinet, flute, saxophone. When we look at all the other industries in the world, right? You know, we're not pharmaceutical, uh, car sales, we're not real estate. We are like super, super, super small um, in the grand scheme of things. And so um, at first I thought, well, because I'm an oboe player, I have degrees in oboe performance. Now I'm opening an oboe repair shop. Everybody's going to flood to me. That's what I thought. 
but it didn't work out that way. And so to answer your question, you do very slowly over time and you do your absolute 120,000% best for every client that you do get and it just builds one client after another. Word of mouth. Um, I haven't officially ever advertised um, because word of mouth in our industry is so important. Um, but I do use social media because it's free now. And of course you can advertise through social media doing Facebook ads and Instagram ads. Um, but just using Facebook consist consistently, uh, Instagram consistently. Um, I don't do Snapchat because I think most of my clientele are older than that maybe. Um, I mean, I know there's oboe players that are 15 and 16, but do you guys use Snapchat? Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I haven't learned it, so I don't, I don't get into that one. Um, but yeah, so how do you cultivate business? You definitely, uh, it's gonna be word of mouth. And so what would the business be, remind me? Okay, so brass repair, there's great money in it. We don't do it for the money, but there is great money in brass repair, especially if you're really good at it. Um, and so, yeah, you just open your doors and you get one, one repair and you do it so well that the people can't tell that it was ever damaged. And then you send it out the door and then they send somebody else to you and just over time that just compounds. Um, you ask those people to do reviews online for you, Google and Facebook. So when they search your business name, the Google search results show up with lots of positive stuff. Um, you go out and you do stuff like this. Um, you go and you meet every band director in, in your county when you're first getting started and you do stuff for free. And you price yourself cheaper than everybody else. If you go cheaper than everybody else and do some free stuff, you'll have more worth than you can deal with. And the money will, the money will come later, uh, for sure. Um, I mean, even to this day, if I have an oboe on my bench that is giving me trouble and I feel that it maybe shouldn't, I will spend as much time as I need to make sure that repair is as perfect as possible but then I will charge my customer what I think it should have been. And so even today, after doing this for 14 years, I don't hardly ever bill 100% of the time that I spent on it. And so for you just starting, it may take you, I don't know, it's been a long time since I was around brass repair, but um, uh, let's say you get a tuba and you have to take off the bottom bow to de-dent it because it's been dropped so many times, right? And so you got to unsolder all that, and then you got to run in and, and do all the de-denting. Uh, probably got to take a guard off the bottom of it to do that and do a new guard. You know, that could take several hours just to do that. And so it may take you as a newbie six hours, but you'll charge them two, and it'll be amazing. And then they're going to send people to you. So that's how I cultivate business in our industry. Uh, word of mouth because it's so so important a lot of extra time so you're gonna work 12 16 hour days and bill for four billable hours are gonna be next to nothing but if you do that you'll have employees you'll have more work than you know what to do with and you'll be pulling your hair out at that point for sure yeah man Okay, you had a question. Um, do you personally do all of your social media outreach? Currently, the way I have it set up, um, so my wife works in the business now, and she does the physical posting. I do most of all the creation. So we kind of have a, a system going now. Um, or, or I'll say, hey, come take a picture of this, this is what it's gonna be themed, and then she'll take it from there. But basically, um, yeah, that's basically how we set it up now. Yeah, so yeah, if you start your business 
and you're doing a lot of the free social media stuff, um, there's nobody else that knows what you're doing better than you. And so you can't hire little 12 year old cousin Johnny <laughs> to do it because they're 12 year old and they've had a device in their hand since they were one and a half. Um, the, the little kids are really great at devices, uh, but this is your business, it's not Johnny's. And so, yeah, the bug, you, uh, you may not have heard the, that phrase, the bug stops here, right? It's, I'm the business owner, so if my, my team member Jonathan does something that a customer doesn't like, it's on me. It's not on Jonathan. We'll have a talk, but it's on me. And so the buck stops, it's your business, yeah. Cool. What else you got? I like answering questions way better than just randomly talking. Skylar. Uh, have you had any negative experiences that you would give to us to, uh, I guess, take heed from? Him? Don't hire teenagers. Okay. Oh. Just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> Those of you that don't know, I, I employed Skylar uh, for about a year. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> Back when he was still in high school. He's all grown up now. So. Um, say it again, negative things like, that have happened to me yeah, or mistakes that I've made. That we can learn from. Okay. Hmm. Well, so the first one uh, that I mentioned already of just thinking that people were going to come to me because I was a specialist, uh, that's, yeah, that's a mistake. Uh, so from the beginning, if you're going to start your own business and the small niche of music, um, well, whether you're starting or you've been in it for 30 years, it's all about the service to others. So every day, everything you do in your business has to be for that. And so I was wrong in my initial thoughts when I was like, well, people are just going to come to me. I don't have to do anything. You know, I'm an oboe player. I repair oboes. I was so wrong. Okay. And so it's because I was thinking about me and not my customer, which I didn't have a customer. So it was, it was hard for me to see that at the time. But, uh, but that's true. That's, that's a big one. Um, I've slept since yesterday. So I don't remember a lot of stuff. I have a terrible memory. Um, I can't think of any other major thing. Um, as far as running the business, when you get into taxes and uh, the state's uh, revenue department, um, you want to make sure one mistake I made in the state of Georgia, they do not charge uh, tax on labor but they do charge it on parts and supplies. In the state of Tennessee, they do charge sales tax on services, on labor. And so I did not do my due diligence when I moved from Georgia to Tennessee. I just assumed that every state operated the same. And so when I went to file my first uh, several months worth of sales tax, and they said, oh, you owe this hundreds of dollars instead of the 50 that I thought I was gonna pay, you know, so I just had to eat that because I didn't collect it, but I had to pay the government, the, the state. So do your due diligence uh, when you start a business, obviously on every aspect of that. And you will find that, say for that, that instance, uh, revenue departments do not help you unless you call them and say, I had this question, I had this question. I don't understand your website. My business does this. How does that affect me? You have to do that because they're going to come and get you uh, for sure. Assuming that you do everything else legally, like get a business license uh, and that type of thing, which I would recommend. A uh, business license or a couple bucks, it's not a big deal at all. Was that? Let's see. Yeah. So, that, yeah, those, those are two kind of big things. 
everything else, anything else that happens negative, uh, and that's where, like, listening to this Gary Vee guy, like, he'll pump you up, I'm telling you, totally. Um, and, uh, yeah, anything that's a negative, you take it and you just build on it. Uh, you learn from it. Uh, so, really, anything that's negative truly is positive because you're going to grow and learn and you're going to keep going. Um, and so, you know, with that and knowing that serving others, uh, the end customer, even if you're a player, who's your end customer? Who are you trying to please and help, right? As my teacher, Dan Ross, he's like, it's that little old purple haired lady right there in the front row, right? that little lady that's worked her ass off all her life and now she's enjoying retirement and she goes to a symphony concert for the first time because she can she has money and your musical product is is what's going to enlighten her her life and her day and so as a player that's what your goal should be and if you do that your other bosses like conductors or deans of music or whatever will probably be pretty happy with you as well Charles. Can you remember who your first customer was? Um, wow. It was clearly not sentimental for me. <laughs> um, the one, the first one I remember, I don't remember the name. Uh, it was just, it was a clarinet though. I do remember that. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I don't remember that one. Now, I do say I, I left the music store on good terms, and so my previous boss, my, the shop manager, uh, brought me lots of oboe work from the music store, and so we left on good terms and had a good relationship. Um, I wasn't going after their business, which was all the school systems. I had no intention of doing that because I wanted to be an oboe specialist, um, and so he kept bringing me work, so it's very possible that that, that music store was my first customer. I, I just don't remember 100%. Do it. All right, so with your business right now, you're able to do a lot like, more detrimental repairs. When you first started, were you able to do some of the bigger repairs that you do now, or did you have to ship them off to somewhere else? So that's a good question. Um, kind of like life, like, I don't know what a good, a good analogy is, but I'm a firm believer that you will not be handed anything to do unless you're already prepared to do it, okay? And that's all, all aspects of life, okay? So like when you're 10, you can't imagine driving down the interstate to go to Chattanooga. But by the time you're 16, you're like, damn it, I'm ready, let's go. I can do anything, right? And so that's the same thing with, with, with my experience with repair. Like, I don't remember anybody bringing me something that was really difficult, some of the things that we do now. Um, it was just all like basic, just clarinet pads and corks and buffing up some keys, making them look pretty and shiny and sparkly and um, you know so now we do tone hole stuff and pinning and tenon replacements except for yours. Um, <laughs> yours was a special case so we, we sent that to somebody else that I knew could do a, a kick butt job on yours so um, um, yeah that yours took special tools I didn't have so I'm not going to attempt to do it if I don't have the tools, right? I, knew, I, I know how to do it, I just didn't have the tools to do it, so decided to farm that one out for you. Um, but yeah, so I think we're all put in positions that we can handle, and so um, I think through the years, it's just the more customers you get, the more varieties of, of repairs that we've gotten, and so I can handle more of those with more experiences. Um, and and so then your tooling and your equipment grows with that. So there's still tools I don't have because I haven't done the repair yet. Um, and so you know we're constantly either buying new tools or making. Matter of fact, just last week I spent, I came in early, 
and I worked from like six to seven for like three days in a row making this new tool um, so that we have to make a custom reed well for an oboe that's in the shop right now and I didn't have the tools to do that particular thing so I basically spent all that time making this tool to replace this reed well in, in the oboe. Um, so yeah we're constantly either buying new tools or making stuff um, to, do, to do things. And there's still repairs that we don't do right now uh, that I'm not sure I will. Um, I just don't, well, 20 more years, I'll probably be doing it. It's just hard to say, but you know, in the oboe world, it's not uncommon for an oboe to crack. And then sometimes the crack goes into the bore and like kills the oboe. But there's a few people in the country that can basically drill the bore of the oboe out and replace the bore without replacing the oboe. And that's really cool. That's a really cool repair. I don't do that one. You know, that one's, that one's still a little scary for me, so I'm not doing that one. But if you come to me with that problem, I'll know who to send you to, because uh, David Teitelbaum is who I send everybody to. The guy's a genius, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so to sum up your, your question, I don't think, you know, I've ever been like totally freaked out and unable to handle, you know, whatever it is. It's just every, every repair you build a little bit more and you can, you feel more confident doing it. Good. So if I or somebody was thinking of pursuing a repair apprenticeship, mm -hmm. would you think it'd be beneficial to do private research and practice before starting or go into it kind of clean and fresh? Because there's always a possibility you learn something wrong or, you know, I don't know, what's your take on that? Well, if you try to do it on your own, how are you going to do that? YouTube? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can. You can start like learning by doing YouTube, and there are a few books. I don't know if there's any modern books. There are some repair manuals from way back in the day um, that I think are considered standard and have lots of great information. I've never looked at any of those, so I don't know. I can't speak to that uh, personally. Um, so yeah, it's it's not it's always good to start familiarizing yourself with whatever you're going after, whether it's repair or you know. So, um, but trying maybe trying to actually cross the fence and start doing it on your own. I mean, yeah, you're welcome to do it, but yeah, you're going to learn so many other different techniques, and you may find that you know the product you're using is you know totally wrong for that scenario or that application. Um, but yeah, I mean, feel free to do whatever you want, but you, you're, you're all, yes, you, you will all, you will learn so much more when you get into, into doing that for sure. Um, but yeah, I, w I wouldn't say never, never be scared to not do something. I'm going to always steer you into doing something. Speaking with me, particularly. Well, maybe um, I'm especially interested in food repair, probably. Yeah. So I did. Somebody from MTSU did come to me. Um, it wasn't you. You weren't here yet. Uh, no. Matthew Lugo. Matthew. Yeah. Anybody know uh, Matthew Jean Lugo? Um, when Matthew was, he's gone, right? He's graduated. He's a big boy. Yeah, he works in access. Yeah, that's what I thought. So uh, Matthew was at this same class, I assume, that he yeah. was doing. So um, <coughs> yes, people have come uh, to us, and I had somebody a couple weeks ago ask me about doing that as well. And so I love teaching. I love helping people. So I'm totally cool with somebody coming to our shop to do that. Um, but you're more or less, you're just going to be watching, right? May have you do some, some little thing. I don't know what it would be. Uh, we don't do flutes at all. So I don't know if other flute people do. And there's a couple.
flu people around here. Um, I don't know if you know the, the new guy at parole, Chris. Okay, so I don't know if parole would allow him for that to happen, but he has a home shop, and I don't know if he would allow, if he would allow that to happen. So you could contact him. Um, of course, then there's Joe B, um, who works for KHS Jupiter up in Mount Juliet. But again, he works for the, co the corporation, so, um, and he, done really, he really doesn't do a, a ton of like bench repair anymore because he's over quality control of the, what's the brand, Altus. So he's doing a QC for all the Altus flutes that are coming in and out. Um, so he doesn't do tons and tons of bench repair anymore. Uh, but he's really well known around the country for his flute stuff. Um, what I'm doing right now on social media, I'm getting out there and I'm meeting other repair people. And so I just connected with a flute lady. I'd have to look it up. I found her on Instagram um, up in the Northeast. Um, you know, and so she's doing that. So if you can do, if you want to do that for this class or for your school here, and they'll let you do that in another state, if you can financially do that, that would be super cool. Um, I would definitely pursue that if it's a viable, viable option. Um, but everybody's different. Um, in our industry of oboe repair, um, I don't know if the other people do it because all the other people, basically, they're just single people working, doing sales and repair out of their houses. And I don't know if they've had apprentices or they let people in uh, to do that or not. Um, I enjoy teaching and, and helping as much as I can, and so that's why I have team members now instead of just me at my house. Um, and that's why I let people in. Um, so, you should definitely do that though. And if you wanted to come to our shop and like outside of say this class for, for grade and just like hang out for one day just to see what goes on because the basics of repair are basics, whether it's flute, clarinet or whatever, um, you know, basic padding, I mean flute padding is way different, like so far different, but, but corks, I'm in Smyrna. I almost took an elbow to you one time. And then you decided to throw it away? Um, I think we took it somewhere else and it was <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, so just in Smyrna, it's like 20 minute drive from here. So, uh, yeah. Any of you guys are welcome. Just give me a heads up. Don't show up. Uh, you're welcome to come hang out for a day if, if you want to. If you want to be awesome, you could. <laughs> you know, um, yes, you're welcome to come. Uh, you're not going to see very much. Uh, like if you want to particularly want to do brass repair, you're not going to see very much to help you. Um, I could show you my buffing room. Brass players or brass repair people spend a lot of time in a buffing room, you know, buffing those big old pieces of plumbing that y'all play. Um, good question. Um, I'll have to say that if any of you guys want to go into repair and you want to be a generalist, so just all band instruments, you could get a job in any city, in any state in the United States. Uh, just last week, I went on, so there's a professional organization, if you all have notes, I'm going to write this down. Um, it's called NAPERT, N-A-P-B-I-R-T, NAPBERT, stands for National Association of Professional Band Instrument Repair Technicians. But if you just write NAPERT down and you Google that, it'll pop right up. Their website it's a, a society for band repair technicians right and so they post job openings you can do this yourself I went there a couple weeks ago I'm not a member of that anymore because I just do oboe and but I used to be um, anyway um, they have job positions and there's like positions available in just about every state 
for every music store, especially the big ones like Music and Arts, y'all are probably familiar with that. Music and Arts is the largest music store on the East Coast. The, it's the biggest, probably the biggest in the country as far as uh, corporation wise. Um, and so they have, uh, if you wanted to work for them, you could get a job with them. They would train you in New Hampshire, I think, which is the, the home base. But then they have regional repair shops. And then some of the real small hometown music and arts actually have people. But, but they basically, because they're a big corporation, they work off of regional shops. So all the small ones send to the regional. Um, so you could work, uh, yeah, you guys could get a job anywhere instantly, especially if you went to a repair school. Um, if you really truly love and are passionate about doing repair and you want to specialize, that's where it gets a little more complicated. So all of your repair schools, and I'll give you some names of some here in a second, none of them do specialization. It's all general band instrument repair. Um, and it's mostly wind. I'm not sure if many of them do stringed stuff. So mostly wind instruments. Uh, they're, I think for if you want to do strings, uh, there's, there are actually specific string repair schools. And I'm not familiar with those at all. Um, but the ones I've got written down that I'll shout out here in a second, um, those are all for wind instruments for general band repair. Like I said, those are general, general schools. Uh, so getting into a specialty is much m more difficult. Um, the way I did it, I just simply just started working. I, got, I went in the music store, got lots of experience doing general stuff. Uh, as an oboe player, I just finally broke away and I did it on my own. But where I, where I got the knowledge and the help, I went around and visited the other oboe specialty guys um, and talked to them on the phone. And if you are actually able to visit a specialty person and you're already doing a repair, you can spend a day and you just hammer them with questions and you watch them work and then you go back to your shop and you replicate it and you don't take anything but 100% top quality work off of your bench, and then that's how you learn and that's how I've done it. Um, I did not, was not able to go and study at say, Loray in Paris, you know, um, or for flutes, you know, I don't know. Sankyo, is that like a big time small flute maker? Uh, Powell. Um, uh, anyway, um, so if you want to specialize, it's harder. Uh, if you've got the gift, you've got the gift, and so you learn and you just go and do it. Um, that's basically how all the specialists have done it, and that's why it's so difficult, and it's why there's not as many specialists probably. Um, so, yeah, that's what I do. So let me give you the, uh, the names of the schools. So if you're looking at a general band when uh, repair schools, uh, one is called Red Wing, it's in Minnesota, nice and cold, and that one's more like the technical college, so there's a lot of uh, lecture, and then there's being in the, in the bench space doing the repairs. Um, there's another one, Western Iowa Tech, uh, I don't, somewhere in Iowa, as you could take from the name. Um, I don't know much about that one. Uh, another one I just found, I really wasn't familiar with it, but I was just Google, Googling this, uh, Colorado Institute of Musical Instrument Technology, C-I-O-M-I-T. I don't know how they pronounce that, commit or something like that probably. Colorado Institute of Music Instrument Technology. And then the one that I went to, which was not an actual school, but just hands-on from day one, is called uh, Badger State. Uh, what's he called? I don't even know what the whole name of the place is. Badger State. <laughs> it's in Elkhorn, Wisconsin. So uh, it's, these are all in very north unpleasant places. Right. Uh, there's none in Miami, Florida. So you can't go there. Um, so that, those are the schools, you can look those up, you can see how to get into those if you're really interested, if you wanna go after school. Um, if you wanna be a specialist, you can start looking at the specialty people in your industry and just start talking to those people. 
call on the phone, social media if, if they do it. Um, just start making connections really slow. You know, like if you if I wanted to sell you guys something, I'm not gonna like try to bring the thing and sell it to you like right like Charles did a while ago, <laughs> right? Charles is like wanting all the information at like the first 30 seconds, right? <laughs> so you take your time, you introduce people, you get to know them, you don't put pressure on them too much, but you just kind of make yourself known. And then over time you make relationships with people. And so that's what you'll have to do with especially the specialty people, you know, because they're super busy. They, a lot of them really don't want apprentices. So they, you know, if you ask them, you know, especially right in the beginning, it's going to be an automatic no. Um, so, uh, let's see. Yep, yep, we talked about all that. Um, That may be. So, and that's a good point. So, um, if I were hiring right now for my shop, being a, a specialty shop, it would be somebody that's graduated from college with a degree, flute, clarinet, oboe, whatever. That's a professional player that can actually play the instrument that they're going to be repairing. And then they wouldn't necessarily have to have instrument repair experience, but they do have to have big time playing experience because we're, we're repairing professional players and you can't repair those instruments unless you can play it halfway decent. Um, yeah, so that's the age restriction. They don't want somebody coming. It's very rare uh, to find somebody right out of high school going and doing repair. Very rare, unless it's a small mom and pop and it's a real small niche uh, situation. I've always heard that the, the only ship that doesn't sail is a partnership. Uh, depends. Do you want to, on the financial end, do you want to make 50% or 100%? Do you want to deal with somebody that gets drunk and um, starts doing drugs and all of a sudden your business is declining because he's a 50-50 partner and you can't get rid of him because he's your 50-50 partner? What if he gets divorced and his wife takes half the business? So those are just a couple, th those are just a couple things that came to mind uh, as far as having a partner. Now I'm, you know, Totally, there's a, a million partnerships out there that probably work, um, but if you were able to find statis uh, statistics, you'll probably find that they don't work more than 10 years. So, and it's probably in the music industry, there's really not enough revenue to go around, honestly. Depends on what it is. You know, if you get into big time music instrument sales, you could pull it off. Yes, sir. What do you what do you play? So not in my shop. But there may be if you wanted to do specialty in French horn, somebody somewhere might take you. I don't know, is there such a thing? A French horn specialist? <laughs> Sorry, that's a joke. <laughs> it's a brass joke. Um, yeah, the way I set my shop up, I would not. Um, which is very limiting for me. If I want to grow, my pool is like nothing. It's dried up, uh, which I have to look really, really hard. Um, so I was, just, I was just very blessed. The two teammates that I have right now totally walked into my life. I did not look for them. And so that's the, really the only reason that happened. So uh, yeah. Um, I know we, we gotta go. So uh, 
entrepreneur, if you have to be told what that is, it's very possible you're not one. <laughs> if you're scared, now don't get me wrong, I was scared when I started my business, um, but I went forward and worked super hard every day even though I did not have the answers. So it's not everybody's, not everybody is an entrepreneur. You look on the internet and it looks like everybody is an entrepreneur, they're not. So if you struggle with that, you may not be and it's totally fine to work for somebody. And when you do work for somebody, you have to work for them like you own a company. Your boss is your number one client every day and you bust ass to do it. And maybe you end up owning that company one day because you work so hard. Um, it it kind of makes me upset. I hear a lot of people complaining about their jobs. Well, go get another one. It's your fault that you're still there. And so you need to find, it comes down to being passionate. You have to be passionate about what you do, whether you're a business owner or a team member somewhere. Because why, why do we want to be miserable? Why do we, if you're going to be a team member and you're going to make less money, why be miserable making less money? So those are kind of some of my experiences, Skylar, of um, I was very miserable working for somebody at the point that I left, which is why I made my one-year plan to leave. I didn't stay there in Waller in my poo. Um, so uh, whoever, whether you're, again, whether you're self-employed or a team member, you give each one of those 100% for sure. Um, the ultimate outcome is serving others, gratitude. You guys, we have it so much better than 99% of the world. We, none of us in here, we all have one of these in our pocket. We have nothing. We have clean water, we have Starbucks. We have zero to complain about. And so it's gratitude and serving others. Um, and then the overnight successes, you all heard of those stories? Well, if you look behind the, the curtain, it was really 20 years in the making. So, those are kind of my takeaways. Any last second question? Thank you. Did I scare you? No. <laughs> cool. <Just your> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, I'm not a partner with anybody. I just, uh, yeah, it can, it can, it can work. If you do do, if you do want to go to a partnership, you got to do so much due diligence and you got to go over every scenario like I just said, like the divorce, drugs, um, disinterest. What if your 50-50 partner decides just to walk away and you never see him again? What do you do then? You can't find him to do the legal paperwork because he just disappeared. So when you do partnerships, you really have to go into all those, uh, all those things for sure. Cool. Thank you guys.